Hey there, and welcome to this video podcast, a joint production between Go Classics and Brown Car Guy. I'm Shazad Sheikh, aka The Brown Car Guy, and as well as being a moting journalist and content creator for three decades, in fact, plus three decades, I'm also the media editor and a columnist at Go Classics. And if you haven't seen it yet, Issue 5 is currently available. It's still available. It's absolutely packed full of features, buying guides, tons of buying advice. And of course, it's got my column in it. You don't want to miss that. And I talk about the phenomenon of converting classic cars to electric. So don't miss that. Check it out. You can still get a copy. Head over to goclassics.co.uk now. You can get it in print or digital formats. So you can read it straight away on your tablet, phone, whatever. Anyway, today I am joined by Go Classic columnist, another Go Classics com- columnist, and that's uh, and he's also a podcast regular, in fact, is Simeon Cattle. Now, he's been working on cars since he was 16 years old. And uh, as an apprentice, he also worked on classic formula racing and Can-Am cars, amongst others. Over the last decade, he's established his own workshop, the Classic Project Shop, where they've worked on hundreds of cars and have restored a load of classics too. But has he worked on any Ford Mustangs? We will find out very soon. But first, let's meet our very special guest for this episode, someone who's definitely worked on one or two or maybe a ton of Stangs. In fact, he's owned over 200 of them. Peter Cavallo of Classic American Car Sales, based over in Essex, has been in the UK since 2004. He's originally from New Jersey in the States and has quite simply lived and breathed Ford Mustangs since he was kids, so pretty much all of his life, you know. Uh, and apparently, it, it, his parents always had to have a 1966 Mustang in the drive, and it had to be that particular year. Why? We'll ask him that question in a minute. From a very early age, he was inspired by his father to buy and sell classics. And a few years ago, he set up his outlet here, Classic American Car Sales, exclu- almost exclusively selling uh, 1965 to 68 Ford Mustangs with the occasional Charger, Challenger, and Corvette thrown in. Welcome, Peter. How are you doing? How's 2022 been treating you so far? Well, we're a month in and it's going pretty good. And uh, good to see you guys. Nice to meet you, Simeon. And uh, yeah, ready to go. So you sell Mustangs in the UK. Yes, sir. Why would you do such a thing? Um, I don't know. Uh, I just... uh, (laughs) Says the guy who's drinking his coffee out of a Mustang, Mark. Look at that. I kept bringing cars in for myself and then they would sell and I would buy another and then it would sell. And then I thought, Hey, this is worth doing. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're about 200 Mustangs in, um, and uh, still going strong. Definitely. So Simeon, just to let you jump in for us, say hello to everybody. How are you doing? How was your new year's and Christmas for regular viewers? <laughs> yeah. Um, Christmas was lovely. Walked away, uh, on the 23rd and got back for the fifth and basically turned, turned the phone off. So everybody had a really good, uh, you know, good rest. Um, but it's phenomenally busy. We had a little bit of work booked in, uh, for the first couple of days. And I thought, well, I'll, you know, at least I'll have a little bit of time to, to work out what we're going to do. But the amount of classic cars that, uh, require attention is, is just mind blowing. So, uh, we're, we're absolutely flat to the boards. And winter is a, is a busy period for you, isn't it? Because winter is pretty much when everybody sort of you know, wants to get their classic cars sorted out in time for the season, which will begin from sort, sort of, of spring, spring onwards. onwards right? Yeah, that's certainly what it is now. I mean, going back 10 years ago when we started the business, I think people were a lot more reactionary. They used to put their cars away uh, for winter and then, you know, start worrying about it mid-March, April, uh, that sort of time. And, and then the season was quite a bit shorter. Um, but, you know, we've had events here um uh, local car events right over Christmas. I could have been on one on Christmas Eve and Boxing Day uh, if I wanted to get divorced. Uh, there was also <laughs> one on New Year's Day if I, I could have got out of bed. Um, and just last Sunday, we we welcomed 4,000 cars and 8,000 visitors yeah. to Bicester Heritage just down the road here. And it's the most phenomenal, uh, you know, January classic car meet I've I've been to so many people so many different cars um it, it, and and it was amazing so I think people are beginning to understand that if you prepare the car correctly um you can use it through the winter but you you've got to make sure it's properly prepared and you've got to give it a really good clean when you get it back Sound amazing. I mean, I really do want to get up to the Vista Scramble at some point because that does sound like an incredible event. And Peter, you went over to the States over the uh, winter, didn't you? 
Yeah, I went. Uh, my dad lives in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I go there about twice a year. And uh, yeah, I just went over. I, I de decompressed as Simeon did. Uh, my phone was on, but I, I just didn't do much car stuff. Usually, it's every day searching for cars. Uh, when I was over in July, August, I bought five. Um, but this time, I just wanted to spend time with my dad. And uh, yeah, it was good. Now, your dad is a real big inspiration to you. I mean, first of all, let's get into the whole 1966 Mustang thing. Why is it that? And then secondly, let's talk a little bit about how your dad sort of got you into this by, you know, basically buying classic cars with you all, all the time, whenever your mom was away, apparently. Yeah, my dad was a bit of a crazy man. Um, it was a couple of things he used to do. Uh, when my mom would go to Chicago to visit her sister, she would go for three, four weeks in the summer. And then as soon as she would pull away, my dad would go, right, let's get a car. And, you know, this was in the, the, the 80s when $500, $1,000, obviously we're in America, so it was dollars. You'd just go to the local car lot and you'd buy a Chevelle or nothing crazy, you know, but a Chevelle or a Mustang. He was into 59 Cadillacs and you would just buy it. And he had a friend who painted for like nothing. So he'd get it painted. I remember he had a 1960 Cadillac painted baby blue. Um, and he'd drive, we'd, we'd drive it for a couple of weeks. And one of the things he'd do is he'd say, let's see what she'll do. And he, he would go to English Town Road in English Town, New Jersey, and he would just bomb down the road like a crazy person in a car we knew nothing about. We should have had Simeon look at it because it probably could have killed us. Um, uh, yeah, and then he would sell it to a local kid um, before my mom came back, and we'd act like it never happened. Um, yeah. Did she ever find out? Well, I have a, a story I really shouldn't tell. Well, Go on. Um, it's, it's only the three of us. There was a catalog <laughs> store, kind of like Argos, um, which which was called Sears. It was Sears. Yeah. And you'd go to the catalog store and you'd order stuff. So my mom used to love um, going there and ordering stuff. And then a week later, you'd go pick it up. So she came home early one time and caught us, you know, with the car. So my dad goes, she'll love it. So he took her and me out and we went to the catalog store and she got out. She went in and it was winter. So we're sitting in the car, and it's me, my brother, Danny, and my dad, and my mom's in the store, and he goes, there's ice over there in the parking lot. So my dad starts doing donuts in the parking lot. All of a sudden, my mom's out front screaming, and the, and the, the manager of the store is going, you know, it's turned into the steer. And my dad's like, that idiot, you know? So that was a great story, you know. But, um, oh, my God. Yeah, she, she would find out occasionally, but... This continued, you know, up to the present day. He, he, he has a serious buying problem if he sees the classic. <laughs> He's tried to buy some of mine and ship them back. And I said, no I just way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your dad sounds like an absolute legend. He's so what's, legend. With the, what's with the 1966 thing? Why did it always have to be a 66 car? They loved, uh, on a 66 Mustang coupe or convertible, there's a, a, a molding on the side that looks like that. It's three chrome fingers. And they just had to have that. And And... Again, my dad would buy these cars. For, my mom was involved in this. She liked the, mm -hmm. the Mustangs as well. And he would buy these cars. And if it was a 65, they would just get the body guy to screw on the 66 emblem. So there's all these 65s driving around with 66 <laughs> emblems that the owners must be like, who would do this? My dad. You know, they had to have that. They had to have that. That's crazy. Yeah. So, Simeon, what about you? Have you worked on any Mustangs? What's your take on the Ford Mustang? Uh, uh, early Mustangs. Uh, you know, I think they sort of lost their way between uh, about 1968 and 2005, uh, generally. Um, but but the early ones and um, and this latest sort of two generations are fantastic. We see um, a couple of fastbacks in regularly. Um, they're cars we've looked after for about four or five years, uh, and I owned um, actually the worst notchback ever. Uh, ever built probably which was a candy red uh six cylinder auto um that i bought out of auction um probably about 15 years ago when i i knew an awful lot less about uh mustangs than i should have done um and just made all all the all the mistakes that anybody could do you know the head gasket was gone it was full of old number plates and road signs that had been sort of bodged together. Um, it was slow. It didn't really make a good noise. The exhaust was hanging to bits, but it looked the business. And, and that really, I was gonna say, yeah. yeah, that that really, you know, it was candy red and it looked cool. And um, and it was like six grand or something. You know, it wasn't particularly dear even at the time. And 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 really. 
although it was a, a terrible, terrible, terrible car, um, you know, I immediately fell in love with it, and uh, and, and I've had a couple of Mustang since. Um, so, uh, but the but the best, my my favourite um, is a one that a customer's got now that I sold on uh, was a two eighty nine fastback. Uh, you know, her four speed shifter on it, and uh, you know all the cool bits. Um, yeah, and it, it's it, they're 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 just fantastic to drive. So this candy red uh, Mustang that you had, did you did you daily drive that? Uh, I would love to have tried, um, but uh, it, it you know it was lucky if it made it a, a couple of hundred yards before <laughs> coughing all its guts up everywhere. So I spent a fortune on well, I thought it was a fortune at the time, probably about uh, the same amount of money again on sort of fixing it up, and then struggled out of it at nine grand. So. Um, you know, it, it it wasn't it wasn't a a, a great money making experience. experience. It's one of those. So when 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 was that again? Uh, about fifteen, maybe sixteen years ago. So fifteen, sixteen years ago, it was still possible to pick up a ropey Mustang for six thousand pounds. That's incredible. Yeah, 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 easy, yeah. Because that's just not going to happen today, is it? No, no. It wouldn't, well, no, it wouldn't. But you know, it was a six-cylinder auto. Um, notchback, so it certainly wasn't. If you if you take the sort of holy grail, you can tell me, but I guess it's a two eighty nine um, fastback from that same era. Um, they're always six, seven, eight times more money than a than a than a six cylinder notchback. So you can get all the look and none of the go um, yeah. for for lots less money. Peter, you know, you talked about a little bit in, in the stuff that you sent me about an era when, you know, you could drive along and you could find these things parked up at gas stations or petrol Absolutely. stations, as we know here, and, and, and it was possible to buy them and run them. And, and you mentioned particularly, you know, when you could still find classic cars being used. Now, we all have this romantic idea living here in the UK of everybody in America driving Route 66 in classic uh, American muscle cars. Is that not happening anymore then? Um, so the period I was talking about was in my uh, 53. So when I was, you know, in my teens and younger, the gas stations before they became mini marts selling food and coffee and all that stuff, um, they were a gas station. They sold petrol and they sold, they had a garage. They would either have one or two garages and a mechanic or two working. So um, the mechanics were always guys in their 20s or 30s or 40s and they were petrol heads. That's why they were mechanics. And they would have a Camaro, a Charger, a Mustang, you know, a Corvair, an Opal GT or something alongside, and usually it had a for sale sign. And that was the primary place that my parents would buy cars. They would, uh, I remember this place called Will Rand Shell, and that was the name of it, W-I-L-R-A-N, Shell, guess. And there would be the mechanic and he'd have a car and they would buy it. And these were 500, 600, 700, maybe a thousand. Um, and they'd buy it and the guy would drag another one out and fix it when he wasn't working on customer cars. Um, so yeah, I mean, even in Pennsylvania, that's a huge classic car area. Um, you see on a Saturday and Sunday, you might see a dozen classics, but they're not going to the shop. You know, you might go get a coffee, cars and coffee or something, but they're not in the supermarket car parks per se, but yeah, there are people driving them, not many daily drivers, um, but what, maybe, what, see, what do you think stops people from daily driving these cars? I mean, one of the things that, and, I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, but ex especially my experience of growing up in the Middle East, and, I, and particularly Saudi Arabia, there was a, there's a huge American car culture in the GCC area. And, you know, particularly in Saudi Arabia, because, you know, Saudi Aramco, the Americans came in, found the oil, and then we all had uh, Dodge Power Wagons, GMC Suburban, stuff like that. In my era, when I was growing up in the Caprice Classics, Buick Park Avenue, Absolutely. GMC Suburbans, they, they pretty much ruled the road, you know. Yes. And the amazing thing about those cars was, I mean, and, and this is interesting, I'll, uh, it'll be interesting to come back to you on, uh, on the Simeon, that the perception here is about quality and all these issues. But in the Middle East, it was the reverse because, okay, yeah, you could have little faults like the trim or the electrics or whatever. But the, the fact that the drivetrain was so robust on those cars, you could do hundreds of thousands of miles across the desert in very, you know, the climate is tough on a vehicle over there, but you knew these things were dependable, you know. So the, so the perception that I've always had is that surely they should still be usable because, you know, inherently they're tough vehicles, aren't they? You're 100% correct. The Caprice that you mentioned, my grandfather was a Chevy uh, salesman for, you know, my whole life. 
um, taxi cabs, police cars, you know, you had the, the limited, you know, the LTD and all that. Those are, as you said, I mean, a Mustang, you can have it run, a V8 running on six cylinders. I just talked to someone the other day. He said he drag raced, uh, not, uh, not drag raced, it road raced his car. He's FIA racing. And he was felt he was down on power and he did an entire race. He came in seventh or eighth. He took the engine apart. The cam was broken in half. So you're a hundred percent right. And I've, I've had a lot of these cars. I've driven a lot of these cars. And I think I can count on one hand, knock on wood for the future, how many times I've broken down. And when I say broken down, it's usually ran out of gas. Yeah. Um, you, you normally don't have a failure of a transmission or an engine blows up. You know, you can overheat it and let it cool down if you don't drive it for 10 more miles. You're hundred percent right. I think the people don't drive it. One thing I find is people restore a car, they spend 40, 50, 60, 70,000, and then they're afraid to drive it. It's too precious. You, I can't tell you how many cars I've bought like that. Immaculate. Mm. I have several in the shed. Immaculate cars that they've driven at 50, 100 miles. They're afraid to ding it. And, and I'm jealous of the guys that do daily drive on this. Yeah. In Malden, in Essex, he drives his white fastback every day to work. And I just see it go by and I go, that's the coolest dude I know. Yeah. You know? So what you said is 100 percent right, and, and and you know Simeon can make these cars as as daily drivable as you want, as as can I. Simeon, yeah, I mean the 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 great thing about American cars is that they were they were they were built to do big distances, and they were built for lot for for really different climates. Um, so you know you've got states in America where it's 50 degrees centigrade, and you've got states in America when it's minus 25. So um, you know they're generally built a little bit on the lazy side uh, in terms of how much power comes out of out of the engine, which is why they have big capacity engines um, which are really well engineered so like Peter was saying they can overheat uh, and cool down and you can get going again without destroying a head gasket whereas if you do that on a little 1300 Austin you know head gaskets ruined and half your engine's got to come apart um, and they have great big radiators in them uh, and it, you know just everything was slightly over spec so um, and so you very much can daily drive them and like uh, like peter was saying um you know one of the reasons why it took so long for the v8s the big american v8s to sort of come out of endurance racing uh was because you could lose half a bank and still carry on whereas if you had a little four cylinder turbocharged engine and and you know something happened on one cylinder then it's game over you retire the car um, so, you know, if you're running um, race cars on, on a shoestring, then you always use a bigger, lazier engine, whereas the guys that have got loads of budget will use a whiz-banger, um, because it doesn't matter if they destroy it, they'll just bring it in and slap a new engine in and away they go again. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it comes down to the holy trinity of having fuel and air mixture right, cooling right, and, and electrics. Um, and if all of those things are fine, then yeah, you can daily drive them. They're tough old beasts. So, you know, I, I, you just reminded me, I love watching the classic racing at Goodwood Festival Speed or the Revival. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you, and then you see the old, and every now and then you see the old American cars and you see these big old things going around on, you know, literally cornering on their door handles, but they're just going at it lap after lap after lap. They just seem indestructible and super powerful. So, you know, and, and it put me in mind of what you were saying earlier about the cars being too precious. Is it almost the case that if you do want a daily driver car, you want something that maybe mechanically drivetrain wise is fit, but not maybe the most perfectly presented car? Yeah, a driver, a driver. It's funny, just going back to what we just said and what Simeon was bringing up, I have two cars that I bought projects. You know, they look like you dragged them out of a junkyard, you know, parts missing, engines look like something from a, a Mel Gibson movie. And um, I was positive they wouldn't run. I mean, positive. And both of them, we got running in about 15 minutes. Didn't even change parts. Didn't even change spark plugs. Just messed with stuff, got the electrics running, dumped some fresh petrol down. And I was, I was flummoxed. I just couldn't believe that these cars ran. And, and they would drive because the, the transmissions rarely give up the ghost. So, yeah, just amazing, amazing. 
Simon, what would you say is the perception or the typical, not 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 amongst our esteemed company and our sort of more um, you know uh, aware company that we have here, but typically the, the 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 impression that American cars have amongst UK buyers? I think they think they're going to uh, be really heavy on juice. Um, first of all, uh, and I think they also worry about part supply, and both of those are such a misconception because okay a, a 66 mustang's gonna do 15 to 18 to the gallon i guess um but 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 you know that's that's about it um but then you know if you if you drive a mark ii jaguar it does 15 to 18 to the gallon um so you know the, the in terms of fuel consumption there's there's almost nothing in it uh, or an e-type or anything like that um, and the other thing is, part supply, honestly, is just the best thing in the world. Um, we do a lot with, we, we do quite a lot of Chevy stuff, so um, we're always on the Eckler's website um, in the States. You know, it's a really good website. You can see all the bits. It's, there's loads of photos, loads of exploded diagrams of, uh, of it. You bash in the details. You know, you can have it literally in 48 hours uh, ready to put in the car. Um, so, so, and, and that's for anything slightly odd. But there are a couple of really good wholesalers here in the UK. US Automotive is one of them. And they hold an awful lot of stock for things like Peter's Mustangs and, and that sort of thing that you can get overnight. Um, so actually, often you can get stuff from the States quicker than you can... Uh, get a Rover P6 bit off off somebody in I don't know, you know, just down the road from you. Yeah, it's really good. Now going back to the fuel consumption thing, I'll tell you what. Uh, people often think you know big V8s are thirsty. But I remember I I I I love V8s, you know, as 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 you know, and I and I've driven them often. I'm, one of the things I miss most about living in the Middle East was was driving the V8s. You know, petrol is cheaper there. But I did astound people because every time I used to run a long termer, I used to do economy runs on them, and I remember like doing some ridiculous uh, economy figure on a uh, Chrysler 300 CSRT, driving it to Dubai from Dubai to Abu Dhabi and back. And I posted up the figure, and nobody would believe me. And I said, "Look, it's not—it's not about the the engine. It's about how you drive it. Because a bigger engine can actually be made to be very efficient if you're not using all the revs. And you can be doing high speed and not using all the revs. It's just about how you you know exactly. you, you nurse that car along." Exactly. Exactly. You know, and, and coming back to you, Peter, just again, the same sort of question to you. What are the perceptions that you've had since you've operated in this market? You started selling cars here from, what was it, 2015, I think, was it? 2015, yeah. yeah. I just dabbled. I bought uh, like seven vehicles. I went to the Charlotte Auto Fair in America, Charlotte, North Carolina, and bought seven vehicles and brought them back and they sold. And then I bought seven more and then they sold. And then I kind of went crazy. I left my job, my normal job, and uh, just started doing this full time. The perception is normally people just smile. They mention that their granddad or their dad or where they used to live, they drove one. And what's amazing is how many people at the shows, I was recently at the NEC where I met you for the first time, yeah. and, um, and they go, I have one, and, and I have one, and I have one, and he has one, and I have three, and I met some, some gents who uh, they have like seven between them. So the history of American cars here is much bigger than I ever expected. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they love them. I, I, I rarely meet anyone that, you know, turns their nose down at them. They all want to talk about it. I was getting my MOT in my Shelby once and I heard a woman shouting, it's a Shelby, it's a Shelby, Shelby, it's a Shelby. And I, I, I turned around and I, she goes, my daughter's name is Shelby. And, <laughs> and after the car, you know, and, uh, and I let her sit in it and she took pictures. She goes, my husband's going to kill me because yeah. he'd love to be here. So it, it's this, it's in people, you know, yeah. they remember going to Maine or Kansas yeah. or whatever back in the seventies and driving these cars. And, and I get guys that show up uh, to buy a car and one guy was holding a matchbox car and he goes, this is what I want. And I was <laughs> like, okay, a little strange, but we can do it. You know? So uh, yeah, people love it. They make people smile. I'll tell you what, I can certainly relate to that. I mean, as you guys know, I, I test cars, I review different cars, but the cars that I get probably the most reaction with, the la last year I had a bullet spec Mustang, a brand new one uh, on test. And 
I, I never had so many conversations with people as I did with that car. You know, That's one time I one time I had parked it, I came back, and a guy was just going, "Is this a bullet? Is this a bullet?" I'm like, "Yeah, it's a bullet." You know, another guy pulled up to me once. He goes, "I want to hear that rev." I'm like, you know. And most recently, I had the the Mac One, the latest Mac One version, the the okay. performance edition. And again, my neighbor was like, "Can I get pictures with the car and stuff like that?" I mean, and and. There's such an evocative thing about Mustangs, isn't there? I mean, I would say that Mustangs are probably the biggest movie cars that have ever existed. And I've got probably a couple of them here. Um, and these are my own models. So as you can see, I've got Eleanor and I've got the, the Bullet Stang, the iconic. These are, these are both icons, aren't they, really? Beautiful. Is it, is it? Do you find that most people relate to these cars in this way, that they, they come back and, oh, I saw it in a movie when I was a kid and, and that sort of thing? I find so many people go, I want the bullet or I want the Eleanor. I would say every project I sell that there's no other choice. They're not going, I'm going to do it the original color. They're either building an Eleanor and a bullet. I sell a lot of projects. Um, I take mint show cars and I paint them Highland green. Uh, um, I just did it with a red 68. I pulled off all the Shelby stuff. It, it's going to be a bullet. I do it all the time. It's absolutely the movie. You get people, they want the Charger from, is it Charger or Challenger from Vanishing Point? They want the Duke's yeah. Hazard. They don't even say what it is. They go, yeah. I want, you know, I want that. I want yeah. the kid. I want the General Lee. And, and that's what I find. And and I think that comes from what you guys saw, you know, in the movies. And yeah. when they found the first bullet, I sold three in a week. And when they found the second bullet, I have sold three in a week. And it just does not, I keep <laughs> waiting for it to stop. You know, my wife says, you're painting another one green. And my friends say, you're painting another one green. I'll buy green. I wish every car I had was green. That's oh, my God. Is. That's that amazing. Is. Even the 65, 66s, which are not the bullet car. No, it's got to be the 68. It's got to be the 68 fastback, isn't it? And you're exclusively doing fastbacks now, aren't you, pretty much? It's pretty much. And yeah. one coupe. But, yeah, if it's green, it sells. And it, I owe it all the bullet. Thank you, Stephen Queen. <laughs> Simeon, do you find the same with your clientele that a lot of them are inspired by pop culture, by what they saw on TV or in the movies? Absolutely. You, you, you know, I, I had a customer just um, just before Christmas uh, and uh, come in and we were doing some work on, on his car. He said, oh, it's going for sale um, just in a couple of weeks. And he had been struggling. It was um, an Aston Martin um, V8 and it was a black, black and black manual right hand drive b plate um uh aston martin and he'd been struggling to sell it had it up for 65 ish grand which was very reasonable considering the you know what it was it went to auction uh two days after the latest james bond came out and of course james bond ruins his db5 in the first half of the yeah. film and then drives timothy yeah. dalton's uh, V8. Yeah, yeah, that right. car did ninety six thousand pounds at auction <laughs> five days after the Bond film came out, My and God. and we've been trying to sell that car since January. Uh, since sorry, since June at sixty five k, couldn't give it away. So you know, the the movies the movies make the cars. There's no doubt about that. And even even adverts. You know, we've had people come in. And ask us for a, for a, you know a car that they've seen in an advert, or uh, you know on on the funny antiques collecting uh, thing uh, on the on the BBC, and you know oh did you see last night's episode? They had this lovely little convertible on, and you know do you think you could find one of those for us? So yeah, movies, TVs, pop culture, long may it continue. Absolutely. I think that's where it came from for me as well. Peter, we talked about, just uh, Simeon mentioned the, the value of, of Aston Martins and how they can fluctuate. We saw 60s American cars a few years ago. I'd say about a decade ago. They really exploded, didn't they? The prices went crazy. Is that still the case with 60s American stuff now? It has went mental. At the beginning of COVID, as we all did, we didn't know how bad it would be. Would there be, you know, a thousand people dying, you know, a day or 2,000 or 3,000 or 10,000? Was it a plague? We honestly didn't know. Uh, I don't think I'm overstating the case. I was scared out of my mind. I have, you know, elderly relatives, my dad and so forth. Um, I had 33 cars at that mm -hmm. time. I went through those like a hot knife through butter. And people were calling me up and just buying the car. And I really want you to come see it because I want happy customers. They're like, no, I want it. And, and that was it. Prices are up for Mustang Fastback since COVID started 
10 to 15,000. Wow. At least, at least some of them are up 20. And every car that I sell now, I don't know how I'm going to replace it. That is how uh, I can't tell you. I'm paying crazy. I'm scared at what I'm paying for cars. You know, and I sold back cars that I sold a couple of years ago. You know, it's interesting because I know that the market in general for new and used cars has gone crazy right now. But I'm not sure that that's what's happening with the classic market because I think the classic market tends to be more insulated from normal market factors. But I think in your particular case, do, would you say it's a case of having people, you know, having the, the fact that we've all faced this uncertainty with COVID and, and basically faced our immortality, if you like, or, or our mortality, if you like, do you think we suddenly thought, a lot of people suddenly thought, you know what, if I'm ever going to do it, I'm going to do it now? When David Bowie died, two days later, a customer called me up. He says, I want a fastback. I'm like, hi, uh, my name's Peter. What's your name? And he's a lovely gentleman. He showed up. And the first thing he said is, my idol just died. And there's no pockets in your shrouds. I'm buying a car today. And he bought it. And he took it to Isle of Wight. He, he just bought it. Um, amazing. I just want to reflect on what you just said about the movie cars. But yeah. One of my favorite stories is a guy came in, and him and his wife, and they were lovely folks. And they wanted a black Camaro. And they're telling me about this movie and telling me about this movie. And I had no idea. Don't, please don't ask me the name because I can't, even, I can't even remember. And they would show me clips from it and pictures that he did and little drawings of what he wanted. I had no idea what this movie was. But he was buying that car from the movie. And he was giving it specs and the color he wanted and the interior and the headlights changed to flip up and flip to the side and everything. We built the car. He was ecstatic. I still don't know what the movie was. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the pull is strong yeah. with, with movie cars, but it, 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 reflecting on the market, I I cannot believe it. I'm actually worried about getting stock. Um, I'm down to 14 cars from 33. Wow! And, and I've I've had turnover, you know, turnover. Wow! And tried to buy stuff back. I cannot replace the cars. Um, I, sp I suppose one of the advantages you have is that being that you're specializing in the Mustang, it was the most popular, or in fact still is the most popular selling you know, sports coupe in the world ever. So there should still be plenty of them out there, right? There is plenty, but, but everyone thinks, you know, as we all know, everyone thinks their car is the best, you know, and, and you got guys, you know, with cars that are worth 40, 45, and they're asking 75. And I'm like, I said, I'm, I'm a whole, you know, I need to pay wholesale. I tell people I'm a yeah. dealer. I'm going to make money on your car. I'm going to fix it up, but I, I can't give you retail and you're beyond retail. You're concourse retail. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, you have these arguments. I'm, I'm sure Simeon does when someone wants to change an engine in the car and he might say it would be better to get another car because you're going to change the engine and spend four, five, ten thousand, but it needs body work and it needs paint and it needs yeah. floors and it needs interior. So sometimes the best decision is to just buy a better car. And I was told that by a friend of mine 30 years ago, and he's right, by the best you can afford. And Simeon, have you also seen the same thing in your, in your arena as well, that people are, suddenly there's been an uptake and people wanting to get into classic cars or fixing up what they've got or, you know, it would value shooting, shooting up? up. There certainly is. I think the, one of the things that COVID has, has done um, also, and it's not necessarily a great thing, is it's given people a lot of time to go online and read up and they've sort of can us guys are really good at this by the way um we we become experts overnight on on things i come back and tell my wife i'm an expert on all sorts of things because i've read it on the internet um and then they they buy uh, you know like peter was saying sight unseen uh on auction sites uh, and it's not just ebay anymore it's things like collecting cars it's uh the market sight unseen purchases go pick it up they swallow the the blurb that's either written uh by you know the uh the original owner in most cases on 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 auction sites um and and they think they've got a fantastic deal because they've cut peter out of it the dealers because they think they think they're expert at it and actually um the 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 process that peter was talking about there where he goes out looks at cars i would i don't know the stats but i would guess he probably buys 10 to 15 percent of everything he sees that's generally not because they're asking too much money for it. it's because they've got an underlying problem that 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 will be too expensive to 
um, to deal with within the market cap of that car. So what ha- what happens to it is it goes to an auction site or it goes to an auction um, where you where where you either can't look at the car or you're under immense pressure to make a, a a decision in a really short period of time. Now that's the mistake I made. You know I've been in the motor trade since I was basically 16 years old. So even 15 years ago, I should have known better. But hey, I'm a guy, I saw a cool looking Mustang, and it was at an auction. And, and I had some money burning in my pockets, and I went and spent it, Um, you know, and then you repent at your own own leisure, really. Um, So so yeah, we've, we've seen that COVID has really pushed the market along it's a bull market not just for mustangs but for just about anything uh right now um again cars i was looking at selling maybe a year and a half ago probably worth 15 to 25 percent more than they were now right now and they're selling fast they're not just sitting around um so you know my my honest advice is pay a dealer's premium because if you find somebody like Peter, who really knows their cars, they've they've made loads of mistakes. I'm sure if you look at Peter's books as well, they'll be cars he's made money on. It. Have you <laughs> seen my history? Um, you know, so Ouch. You know, to, to a great Go on, deal, Peter. Reveal all. Reveal all, Peter. What was your biggest mistake? Uh, well, uh, a quick one. It was a recent auction. You saw the car. I'm sure you did. Um, it was a gold fastback. And I looked at it and I needed stock and it looked great. And I went very well known auction house and I, I snuck in because they were, you had to buy a, um, a brochure to, you know, to get in. I snuck in and I looked at the car. It was covered in blisters, not just micro blisters, blisters. That car needs a bare shell, bare shell takedown and repaint. You're not going to scuff that and paint that. So that's 10,000. I looked underneath it. There was like tape around the exhaust. The exhaust was comically bad and it was described as a beautiful a lot of money spent car someone is as Simeon said they buy it and someone bought it and paid big money for it and they have at least 15,000 to spend my biggest mistake I had a car um, that was described to me as a show car and um, it was up on the lift at my mechanics and I kept looking at the floor and I know what the floor should look like and I'm looking at it I'm like Scott it just didn't look right around the edges. And I'm like, but there's no rust. The transmission tunnel didn't have any cuts. And I'm just looking at it, looking at it. And then I pushed on it and it lifted up. So to cut the long story short, it was a used floor they had cut out of a car and glued it in with mastic. The floor was just sitting in the car. You could push the entire, the the, the guy who fixed it and put a full one piece original style floor in it he said, I didn't have to cut anything. I pushed the floor out. <sighs> yeah. Oh, my um, God. I, 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 I get cars inspected, and then they show up, and we have to replace quarters and drop-offs and frame rails, and we do it. Um, a real, real quick one. This is going to make you laugh. My dad bought three cars. He's a crazy person. Years and years ago at an auto museum place, a very famous place in Chicago. He bought three cars. The first one came off the carrier, and there was rings – of rust on the floor, like divots of rust that had fallen out just on transport. So that was a 69 Mach 1 that needed the bottom oh, 10 damn. inches replaced. But he had a pickup truck and he ended up selling it to me for really cheap. It was a beautiful Chevy pickup truck, power steering, power brakes, automatic air, 60s, 68, 67. And I was under it one day and the underneath was beautiful and I'm looking at it, it's all black, very light undercoating. And it was a bit of orange or, or yellow. And I touched it. The frame rail was spray foam. They had spray foamed the frame rail and carefully trimmed it, sanded it, and painted it black. It was a death trap. Yeah, I sold it for five grand. With full disclosure. But I had like 18, 19,000 in it. Oh my God. Oh my yeah. God. So that's again, there's some real horror stories there alerting people to not buy sight unseen and go to an expert. Mm-hmm. Coming back to, to I, I think we've learned that lesson. So coming back to cars themselves and coming back to values and, and looking beyond Mustangs as well, American cars, like I said, in the, the 60s cars 
you know, they, they the values shot up a few years ago and they're still going up, as you've already said. We've seen that with some of the 80s cars now, haven't we? We've seen that with the Bandit Trans Ams and stuff like that, where they've yes. really gone crazy. Is that now beginning to happen with, with 90s cars? and stuff? So, for example, the Camaro IROC Z, Z28s and the Knight Rider Trans Ams? Grand like Nationals. That? Grand Nationals, the ZR1 Corvettes. Um, absolutely. Uh, I mean... Every era, you know, we look back to the 60s um, and the 70s. Guys now that are in their, you know, 30s and 40s making maybe 100,000 working for a bank, they're looking at when they were a kid in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, you know, the Buick Regal Grand National is a great mm -hmm. example. And the GNX and, and, and the Corvettes, the early Corvettes, absolutely. The performance cars of the era, it's always going to be popular. I don't know what folks in 10 years are going to hark back to. Yeah. Uh, you remember the batteries in that Prius? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but, but even things like, so for example, I remember I wasn't a huge fan of these, but the Fox body Mustangs, you know, the, you know those ones, right? And I, and, and I was, and I was never a fan at the time, but apparently now they're big, they're going, they're changing for big money. I wanted one since I was 14 years mm -hmm. old and I bought one about four years ago. It was a police edition. Oh, wow. Um, SSP um, had all the history. And, and I just, I had to buy it. I wanted it. I've always wanted a notchback 505 speed. And I, I had to buy it. I had to fulfill that dream. And I did. So, yeah. How was it? It was horrible. <laughs> I, drove, I drove about 25 yards and decided I was a fool. It, it, it was very stock. It needed proper seats. Yeah. The, the, the rear diff changed from a 279. Yeah. It, it was a beautiful, beautiful car. A lot of fun. My wife never wanted to drive it because it had all the police lights and sirens <laughs> and speakers on it, and she refused to drive it. I was at a show once, and my wife was with me, and she was like, don't, don't, don't use the, the, the speaker or the, the siren. And then someone said, you know, would you mind driving it around the ring in the center? Yeah. And my wife just put her head in her hands. <laughs> So we're driving around the ring in the center, and someone goes, "Use the siren!" And my wife, she she like went onto the dashboard, so I clicked on everything. So it was a fun, fun car. Ten thousand was ten thousand yeah. dollars, but that car now would be twenty five thousand. Wow! So Maybe talking five years ago. So what are hot tips right now? We've obviously obviously we've established that Mustangs are un, un, unburstable, but what what are hot tips right now when it comes to American cars? What should you be getting into, which you can still just about afford? Two door V eight. And the performance edition. I always say, you know, if you you know if you can't afford the performance edition, buy the six cylinder. They're ton, tons of fun. Um, get the V8, get the performance edition because the same as property, the standout property, the standout car will always be in demand. You know, if there's ten IROC Zs, I want the 5.7 liter. You know, I don't want the 302. I want mm. the 5.7, uh, the 350. Um, so, when, when, you know, when, when you see a car, the big thing at the shows is people look in, oh, it's a four-speed or oh, it's a five-speed. I'm not saying the automatic is not desirable, but get the thing that's a little different. The best color, the two-door rather than the four-door, the V8, the performance model, the manual. So, uh, what if you were to buy one, an American car at the moment... What sort of budget are you looking at? So for those people that are maybe just on the edge thinking about it and they're like, well, I may have enough money, but I'm not sure. Can I buy it? Can I afford to run it? Can I afford to maintain it? Can I afford to insure it? You know, in a, in a sort of ballpark figure, what sort of budget are people looking at? I would say 20,000 pounds should buy you a nice car. Not the, not a fastback, not the most incredible model, but you'll get a V8, probably 15, you know, in a non Mustang, um, you know, a, a, a Caprice or, or, or a, a Nova or something like that. Um, 20 to 25 will get you a nice base model. It won't have the insane rims and all the disc brakes and the crazy 396 or 454 V8 or the hypo. Um, but, you know, the Mustangs are now in the 70s, you know, for the for the hot model and the best mm -hmm. color and, and, and shiny and new. As far as maintenance, I'll, I'll leave that to, to Simeon. But, uh, you know, an oil change once a year, a check over by a competent shop such as Simeon's. Um, and you really, you know, you don't have to do these crazy, you know, full fluid changes and engine out services, oil filter every couple of years, brake fluid and transmission fluid and get it looked over. Change your brake cylinders if it needed. Preventive maintenance is much cheaper than than fixing it after it goes wrong. And, and Simi will be your expert on that. 
Simeon? Yeah, I mean, I always say with any collector's car, you've got to have a budget of a grand a year tucked away because you often, especially if you've just bought it off Peter or something and it's been fully serviced and it's all, you probably won't spend that grand in the first year. You might not even spend it in the second year, but in the third year, you're going to do maybe some tyres and or, you know, brake cylinders or a new caliper or something like that. And that'll about work out. So I always say, you know, as a minimum, if you buy a really good and together car, um, a grand a year. Uh, if you buy something that's a bit more of a rolling project, then you've got that grand to spend a year and you've probably got another two to slowly bring it up to up to um, standard. Um, mechanically, obviously, if you go and do paintwork or interior retrim, you can blow five, ten grand at a time uh, doing those sorts of things. But um, but yeah, that's a, that's about the size of it. Insurance is cheap. Um, somebody right. like Hegarty or any of the any of the specialists all run American policies. Um, usually a couple of hundred quid a year max, really. Um, and what was the other what was the other cost? You no, that that yeah, that was it. That was it. The running, the maintenance, and the insurance costs. So that's the interesting thing. So as we come into a close on this amazing uh, session that we've had talking about American cars, I think a final word from each of you, basically to encourage people who may be thinking of pursuing that dream but are just maybe hesitating, why they should do it, why they should do it now, and uh, what does it take to actually do it. Peter, we'll go with you first. Um, I suggest doing it now because you know. I think it's going to become harder and harder to locate these cars. I'm struggling and I have contacts everywhere in this country and in America. Um, I've bought cars from Canada. You know, the prices are going up. You know, past performance is not indicative of future performance. I'm not the, the trader that goes, this car will definitely go up in value. But in my experience, since 2015, they've went crazy. Um, I hope that continues. Um, but I, I think the smiles it brings, the enjoyment and, and I tell a little story um, that was told to me. When you're looking at these cars, and, and you drive them once a week, once every two weeks, once a month. And when I have someone indecisive about, let's say, two Mustangs, they're looking at a convertible and a fastback or two different color fastbacks, and they go, Peter, tell me what to do. And I, I tell them this story. And I say, okay, you work in London, you live in Essex, it's winter, it's, it's, it's dark until 8 o'clock, it's dark at 4.30, okay? You get up in the morning, your wife's sleeping, your kids are sleeping, the dog's snoozing, you're heading to the train in the rain and it's dark. You're not going to see them, the kids will be sleeping when you get home and your wife will be grumpy because she's done all the housework. What do you want to lift the garage door up just to look at before you take that train into London to slog mm -hmm. your guts out? What blows your dress up? And that's what I tell people. And I actually get a chill and I just did every time I say it because I go in the garage. I don't drive my cars a lot because I don't have time. My green 68 Fastback blows my dress up. And that's why I own it because it makes me happy. <laughs> Simeon? Yeah, I mean, wise words. Always buy what's uh, going to blow your dress up um, and buy the best you can at the time. Um, so, so, so if you, if you basically, if you put those two things together, um, with the preventative maintenance, you will have a good relationship with your old car, whether it's American or not. Uh, in terms of why you should buy an American car over a British car or French or German or whatever else, um, you know, why do we all love going to McDonald's when there are other cuisines out there? They're just great. You know, they they're not pretending to be anything more than they are. Um, but but you know, it the a, a Big Mac's always welcome, and uh, always. Dri driving around in a Mustang just makes everyone smile. You and and whoever you drive past. So really, you're doing a public service. I love it. That's a brilliant. That is a brilliant point to end on. That not only are you you are making your dreams come true, you are enjoying yourself, but you're doing a public service. And actually, I can relate to that. I think it's absolutely true. Talking of which, I definitely have to go and buy a lottery ticket because I've got to do this soon. Honestly, you know, <laughs> I've wasted way too much time as well. I've got to do this. You have certainly both of you inspired me 
to, to, to try and do this and, and to try and get something like this. And I hope that we've inspired the people that have been listening and watching to this as well. Thank you once again so much, Simeon, for joining us. And Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure and an absolute delight Thank to have you on course. board. Thank you so much. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care. So just before we go, Simeon first and then Peter, give your businesses a shout out. Let people know where they can find you and how they can find you. Okay, so we're Project Shop. We are a general service and maintenance garage for all classic cars, uh, American or not. Uh, everything, you can see them up behind me from a Volkswagen Beetle to an Aston Martin, anything in between. Um, uh, and uh, we're based in Bicester, just near Bicester Heritage. And you can find us at projectshop.co.uk. Hey, you doing, guys? Uh, I am classicamericancarsales.co.uk. I uh, search out, import, and repair classic, Amer uh, classic Mustangs from 65 to 68 uh, with an emphasis on fastbacks. Um, and I also sell projects. I sell driver quality cars and I sell show cars. And we can do any level of what you need to them. We can get them painted or fix whatever you want or sell it just the way it is. Happy to talk to you. And we're located near Colchester in Essex. A big shout out and thanks to Jay Williams over at AirTechnic who are my top tier sponsors. Check them out at airtechnic.co.uk for exhaust, brakes, suspension and body kits. Plus my other major sponsor, Riverhall. Much appreciation also to my tier 4 sponsors, Muhammad Ali Hamid and Tom Conway Gordon. And of course all of these other guys who are supporting me on Patreon. I am eternally grateful because without you, I can't be creating all this content. Hey, think about joining them. Head over to patreon.com forward slash brown car guy. If you can't, don't worry. Just make sure you're subscribing to my YouTube channel and my website plus follow me on all social media channels by searching for hashtag brown car guy